what I wanted to do was talk to you a bit about the neuroscience of creating a habit, meeting your goals, and motivation. Neuroscience, right? So some of you might know that that was my background. I actually did genetic research in neuroscience in college and graduated with honors for that. Um, my board special, my uh, board certification is in neurology and psychiatry. So the brain is kind of my, one of my favorite things in addition to nutrition that impacts cellular repair. And I want to make sure that maybe if you understand more about what you're going through, perhaps it'll help you stick with it. But let's talk a bit about what actually happens in your brain when you set a goal, right? So a goal, if you talk about the definition of a goal, it is a detour from the path of least resistance, meaning there's a certain thing that you do every day, your habitual life, but a goal is a detour from that habit. This is, I want to do something different. I want to do something that's different from my typical habit and way of doing things because I want to achieve something, right? So my guess, if I ask all of you now, if you've ever had a goal, let me know if you ever had a goal, right? Most of us have had goals, whether it was graduating high school or getting a certification in something, or maybe going on a trip somewhere where you had to save up for it and plan for it. A goal means I want to do something different, right? But the thing about goals is they tend to be somewhat difficult to achieve uh, because of that deviation, because we have to do something different and consciously and put energy into something no, uh, new. And so that's why even when we know they're achievable, sometimes we can feel a resistance or find that they are difficult, right? So there's two major difficulties in achieving a goal, right? The first one is actually learning the skills and the information you need to achieve it right? In order to achieve a goal, like let's say reversing your disease, you need to know what to do. <laughs> That's what I'm doing every day for all of you, right? I've written books. I've written, you know, we have Goodbye Lupus, Goodbye Autoimmune Disease. We have Goodbye Lupus, Hello Delicious, which literally gives you the recipes. Just eat this food, right? So you have to know what to do. Uh, maybe you've seen my online classes. Maybe you watch all of my YouTube or Instagram videos, but the first difficult thing is actually learning the information, right? The second part is applying it, which requires effort and motivation. And that's where people start to run into some difficulties, right? I've met so many people who are great at learning the information. They're watching all the different channels. They're reading the books. They're going to conferences, but creating the actual outcome is where the struggle. How many of you have struggled with that? You're welcome to chat with me here about it online, right? So the thing about it is there's different parts of your brain that are in charge of doing what's routine and in charge of doing new tasks, totally different parts of your brain, okay? So routine means that it requires very little or no conscious attention, right? So it could be something simple like turning on the TV or opening your Instagram app depending on where you're seeing me right now. Routine, almost no conscious attention at all. And it can be something as simple as turning on your TV or it can even be complex, like driving to work every day. If you've been driving the same route every day, driving is a complex thing that you're doing. It requires many different things. You're checking mirrors, I hope. And uh, the pedals, right? And checking your speed, right? It's a complex task, but once it becomes routine, requires very little information so, uh, or attention. So, so there's an older part of your brain that's in charge of routine. And these old structures are where we store our habits. And that way, our attention can be open to the environment. This is an evolutionary advantage, right? You can pay attention to your environment because your brain has turned the things that you do on a regular basis into habits where you don't require any attention to them, right? So that's why something that you've been doing for a while suddenly doesn't take any attention. My son is uh, about to learn to drive and I was telling him just this, in the beginning, it's gonna be anxiety provoking and you're gonna be just constantly trying to figure out like my speed, my mirrors, who's in front of me, who's behind me, right? It takes all this effort and attention and eventually, your body's going to just do it and you're not going to feel that stressed about it anymore, right? So those are the, the old parts of your brain that handle that. Now, the parts of your brain that handle a new goal or task 
Um, that requires something we call executive function. So executive function uses the parts of our brain that are required for new things. We're try- we need to focus on, on accomplishing something that is not a habit, okay? And it requires our working and short-term memory and our attention, all right? You can't do a new thing without your attention being on it, right? So the characteristic features of something that's using, you know, this executive function, these novel tasks, all right, is that it requires effort and it requires conscious attention, right? So you have to put your whole attention on it. So for example, your conscious attention, what I mean by that is, um, if you are listening to me on YouTube right now, you might not be giving me your full conscious attention. Maybe you're chopping vegetables. Maybe you're writing down a list. You're doing other things. You're not giving me conscious attention, right? Conscious attention is required for other things, though. So, for example, if you're reading the label of ingredients, you can't read a label and do something else at the same time. You require conscious attention to be able to do it. So, again, in order to have a goal, which is a novel new thing, you're going to change the course of your life. You've been on the same highway, doing the same stuff, eating the same way, doing the same things every day. And now, boom, you have a goal to be better, to do better, to do something else. You need to use executive function, which requires working memory, all right? That's your, one of the short-term types of memory, and conscious attention, all right? Now, the issue is when you have to put your conscious attention on something for a long time, it can create mental fatigue. How many of you can relate to this, that you can sit at home relaxing on a Sunday and your energy is fabulous, but... When you have to sit at your desk at work all day or at school all day, focusing on something with your full attention, you kind of feel exhausted by the end of the day. That is the mental fatigue of using conscious attention for a continuous period of time. So I'm hoping this is starting to click for some of you. When you're trying to create a new habit, you want to start eating better. Let's say you want to start hypernourishing because you're listening to me right now. I hope that that's part of your goals. You want to start hypernourishing, right? And you're going to start aiming for, I'm going to eat a pound a day or more of raw cruciferous vegetables. I'm going to get a handful a day or more of flax or chia seeds, all right? Or a few tablespoons a day of flax oil. I'm going to start hitting 96 ounces a day or more of water, right? Again, if you don't have a kidney failure or any kind of restrictions on your diet, okay? So let's say you decide you're going to do that. In the beginning, it's going to take a lot of conscious attention. you got to track when you shop to make sure you don't run out of ingredients. You've got to remember to drink your water. If you're used to barely drinking any water at all, if you the water you drink is what you swallow uh, when you're gargling or something, <laughs> when you brush your teeth, and suddenly you want to drink a gallon or more of water a day, that's going to take conscious attention. You have to plan it out. You have to remember. And in the beginning, you mess up. You fail because what happened? You took your conscious attention off of it, right? It's not a habit yet. And if it's not a habit, then you're going to slip into your habitual way. And maybe your habitual way is not to drink water. Maybe your habitual way is to not eat during the day or to snack on candy that's on your, your neighbor's desk or something, right? So in the beginning, that's part of why it's so hard is because your habitual mind wants to take over because it is a tiring thing to put your conscious attention on something all the time, right? But the good news is if you continuously put your conscious attention on something until it becomes a habit and psychological research has has shown that it takes on average about 28 days to make a new habit, suddenly you don't need conscious attention to do it anymore. Phew! Can you put a month of effort into this and turn this into a habit? Yes, you can. But in the beginning, it's going to require conscious attention to this new thing. And sometimes it will feel tiring. Like, I don't feel like drinking any more water. I don't want another bite of that broccoli, right? Sometimes your old mind is going to resist it and go, let's just do our usual routine. So... In the beginning, you have to understand this. And as one of my clients who is still doing extremely well today, years after doing rapid recovery with me, she is out and about skiing, feeling great, no pain. She told me once, you know what? It was hard until it's easy. And that is the most beautiful way to summarize the neuroscience of creating a new habit because of a goal. That is the way. 
It is hard until it's easy. If you stick with it and if you decide this is worth your conscious attention because the goal you have is big enough, then eventually, not that long after, about a month in, it will become a new habit. And that's what we see in our programs where we work with people every day, whether it's four weeks of rapid recovery privately or my six-week group. What we find is the first two to three weeks is hard for people. That's why they need the support, right? That's why they come to us as they go, oh my gosh, in the beginning, it's like, oh, I have to eat and I have to put my food and I have to drink the water and then I have to pee all the time and oh my God, I'm bloated and da, 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 da. And it feels like all they're doing is thinking about food. And then after about three weeks and change, suddenly, ta-da, they will start telling me, you know what? I woke up today and I just craved a smoothie. Why? Because it's being integrated into the older part of the brain that is associated with habit. So if it feels hard, but your goal is important to you, you don't quit. You keep reminding yourself that if you stick with it, you will achieve it. And that's true for changing your health. That's also true for any other thing that you want to do. If you have a big goal for your life and you have to put your attention on it, right? Right now, my son's big goal is actually getting into the college he wants to go to. And suddenly, all he wants to do is study, even on the weekends. It's awesome, right? But before he didn't feel like doing that. But suddenly once he had his sights on, I know what I want to be and I know where I want to go. Suddenly he's willing to do that work and pay that attention every day because the goal is so big and important to him. And now it's become a habit. It's a habit. Now he gets home and he just sits down and the books are open and he's cheerful, just doing the homework, right? It's become a new habit. And so anything that's important to you enough, so important, you've made it a goal, you've got to be willing to go through this part, okay? Now, the second part I mentioned, right, is motivation. So motivation is really, um, it's a deviation from seeking what you want most versus what you like in the moment, right? So um, in the moment, you might like having a cupcake. <laughs> you might like just laying around, sleeping in, being on your couch, right? That might be what you feel like doing. But motivation means you are seeking something you want more and you're willing to not do what you like in the moment in order to get what you want. I'll give you an example I did today. My alarm went off this morning so I could get up and go work out before work. In that moment, what I wanted to do, what I like to do was going to be to go back to sleep. <laughs> That is what I like. I love sleeping in the morning, right? But what I want, I want to be healthy. I want to live a long life. I want to be able to have the energy and be the role model that you need. I want to be able to be there for my son through his whole life to help with it, with my grandkids and my great grandkids. I want to grow old with the man that I love. And when I keep teaching and helping people out there have the lives they want. So what I want defeats what I feel like in the moment, because I'm so clear. My whole book of autoimmune disease is all about this mental part, right? How do you get the motivation to do what you want instead of what you like until you achieve it, right? And this is essential because as I just taught you, the brain resists the new habit, right? It takes so much mental fortitude and focus and it wears you out at first until it becomes a habit. How do you push through that? Motivation is how you push, push through that. Now, we have a built-in mechanism in our brain, more neuroscience for you, that reinforces doing what we want. It's called dopamine, all right? These dopaminergic pathways play, a, it's a reward system, we call it, plays a critical role in helping people do the things that they need to do. The problem is we've hijacked that system, Right. So, for example, when I exercise, I get a big hit of endorphins and dopamine because I work hard. However, we don't need to exercise to get those endorphins and dopamine, do we? We can eat sugar. We can eat greasy, oily foods and we get the reward without the work. And this is why the standard Western diet is so addictive, because you can reward yourself all day long while doing nothing. So this is essential to understand because people often feel like if they can't do this or they struggle to do this, they are weak. And I hope what I'm teaching you right now is you are not weak, you are human. And our brains fight this and our lifestyles make it hard for us to actually form the new habits we need because we can bypass 
doing the work to get the dopamine by just eating things that give us dopamine, right? And so what happens is our brain really just wants the reward. And if we can get it in an easier way, we will do it, right? So uh, they have found, I'll give you an example here, you know, what's better reward than using food-like drugs like sugar? Cocaine. Cocaine will give you even more dopamine than sugar. So what happens to people who are addicted to cocaine? They stop eating. You ever see, I used to work in addiction medicine. They become emaciated because they stop craving food because they're getting the reward they want in excess from the drug. What happens when you take the drug away, when they go into rehab? They start overeating, seeking the dopamine and often become obese. They start smoking to get the reward on their dopamine receptor from something else, right? The brain is seeking reward. When I can get folks who are coming out of addiction to food or drugs to exercise instead, they suddenly become addicted to exercise and hallelujah, isn't that the addiction we all want, right? So it's really important to understand how important it is to replace that reward if you want to stick with this long enough to turn that new goal into the habit. So what I'm teaching right now is literally the science behind why my rapid recovery programs work. They work because number one, I make sure people eat the foods in the right way, in the right amounts for their disease and their disease reversal, right? That's number one. Number two is I teach them how to replace the rewards. The first week right now, we have a group that just started and they are in this first week right now. And the biggest focus we have is learning the right self-care techniques to replace the reward. Because if you can get the reward going from an activity, you won't, you won't crave it from the food. All right. So if you're doing this on your own, that's what you need to do. If you find that this just keeps feeling hard and you never get to the point of habit, first of all, now you understand why. Okay. You're going to have to accept that it will be mentally a bit difficult until it becomes easy. Right. And it can be as simple as a month before that happens. Don't quit. But you also must understand that if you can replace the reward, if you can get that dopamine through fun, social activities and exercise if you're not so inflamed and in pain that you can't do it, right? One of those things, if you can consistently get that dopamine pathway working from activities, your food can just be the food you need to heal and the cravings will be dramatically better, okay? So hopefully now, you're all ready now to take your final exam in neuroscience and understanding how the brain actually creates new habits why it's so damn hard <laughs> and how to actually replace the rewards to make it easier and even fun for yourself.